Yeah, so 2 Thessalonians is what's before us. I mentioned already the idea of a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. We have done the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians. Here we are early on in the three-chapter book of 2 Thessalonians. And, you know, sometimes people come to church with the idea of, uh, Pastor, what do you have for me? I've been through this and that, uh, you know, this week, and I've struggled with this, or I've thought about that, or I've been faced with this situation. So, Pastor, what do you have for me? Well, um, here's what I have. I have the privilege of communicating to you the very words of God. I don't have a fortune cookie answer uh, uh, to, to the problems that you may be facing, but I have what Job describes. Job, you know Job, you know Job, you know. Suffering, wow, Job. He wrote the book on it, okay? Uh, Job knows all about it. He wrote the book in a metaphorical kind of way. And yet he's the one that said that he desires the word of God more than he desires his necessary food. And so again, I say, I don't know what you're facing, but I am privileged to continue this verse-by-verse -verse sermon series and to offer to you the word of God. And it, being in church as long as I have and in full-time ministry uh, for a little more than two decades, I've heard a lot of preaching myself, and what I found, at least in my own heart condition, as I faced my own personal struggles in times of trials, times of suffering, what I found is that if I approach the preaching of the Word of God with a heart to hear from heaven, then no matter what text or even what topic the preacher is, is focusing on, there's usually something in there that God had just for me, um, and just for my moment, just for my situation. And you know what? Uh, I've been in situations, and I know a lot of preachers because I am uh, in that uh, vocational ministry, and there have been some times I've been sitting out there, and I didn't even like that preacher, okay? I ain't even friends with that guy. For whatever reason, I just don't like him. And then the Holy Spirit would prick my heart and say, well, you're an awful person. Why don't you like him, you know? And I want to communicate to you something from my word, so get over yourself. And so then I'm sitting there all rebuked, and then I'm listening, and I'm thinking, Lord, what do you have for me, and I'm telling you, every time when I ask the Lord to feed me from his word, in spite of the messenger, whatever a person may think about the messenger, that message from God was, is always there for me when my heart is in the right place. So I want to encourage you to, to avoid listening to preaching with maybe a cynical spirit, not that I would think anybody here would have that, but in our flesh, we have propensities sometimes in, in sinful ways, and then maybe avoid listening to preaching this morning with a sleepy spirit. Now, there's some of you that probably have that one there, okay? Uh, and by the way, the rest with us in the text has nothing to do with you sleeping, okay? Uh, but uh, avoid the sleepy, and instead, hear the words of God with a spiritual kind of an attitude. Again, a contrite heart, a, 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 a spirit that says, Lord, feed me. I need your words more than I need my necessary food, my, my uh, noon lunch th this, this afternoon here. So, um, if we approach this text with that spirit, I am sure that the God of the Bible, you ask him, God, speak to me, help me this morning. I promise you, the God that we know, he will answer that prayer in the affirmative because his word is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible, it is profitable, and, uh, and profitable in so many ways. And so let us benefit from the profit of the word this morning. Second Thessalonians, we pick up. Uh, here in mainly verses 5 through 10 is what I'd like us to consider, the content here uh, of chapter number 1. Um, and I want to give uh, these verses this heading or this title this morning, and that is when Christians suffer, when Christians suffer. And you see a lot about suffering uh, in these verses. And for us to really appreciate the content of, of 5 through 10, I must uh, remind you of the points we made from uh, 3 and four there in 2 Thessalonians chapter number one. Remember that uh, early on, Paul is praising the people of God. And remember who these Thessalonian believers are. Uh, this is not the church at Ephesus who left their first love. Uh, this is not a, a Laodicean church, a, a lukewarm church. I mean, this is the church at Thessalonica, the model church. These people, according to 1 Thessalonians, the five chapters there, they were doing a lot of things right. It's a good church. 
And so it's appropriate when he writes his second letter that he would praise them. And he praises them in verses 3 and 4 of 2 Thessalonians for, as we pointed out last Lord's Day morning, for a lot of the same things he encouraged them to be in 1 Thessalonians. And we drew the parallels that are appropriate in the text uh, between 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So you may recall uh, in 1st Thessalonians, he encouraged them to be people of faith and to continue to have a labor of love and to have an enduring patience. And here in 2nd Thessalonians 3 and 4, those were the same headings that we find in the text. That, that because in 1st Thessalonians, he encouraged them to be people of faith and love and patience, then he opens the book with, hey, I praise you, Paul, their spiritual leader the one who was part of the human uh, impetus of the church plant, the genesis of the church plant in Acts chapter 17. He's now saying early on in 2 Thessalonians, hey, your faith is growing. Good job. It's meat for me to praise God for you. It's the right thing for me to do because I charged you to have more faith and now I see a people who are growing in their faith. And remember last Sunday morning, we noticed that they're also abounding in love and What will allow us now to appropriately transition uh, into the verses 5 through 10 that are before us this morning is uh, is he also praised them for having an enduring faith, an enduring faith. And you see that at the end of verse number 4. Let's look at verse 4 in its entirety. It says, so that we ourselves glory in you, in uh, the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So we gave verse number four this heading, this idea of an enduring patience. You see uh, this idea there uh, in the text. And so it's appropriate for us as we're going to endeavor to rightly divide five through ten to see that verse four leaves us off with this idea of an enduring patience. And specifically, they had an enduring patience in the areas of persecution and tribulation. All right, so I want you to see four things in verses 5 through 10, and I'll give them to you here uh, at the outset, and then we'll walk through them uh, together this morning. I want you to see the reminder that he gives, the reminder. You'll see also the recompense that so encouraged these suffering people. Um, You'll see this, this idea of rest in the text, and then you'll see an inspiring revelation. Uh, an inspiring revelation. So you'll see a reminder, a recompense, a rest, and a revelation. And all of that is in relationship to suffering when Christians suffer. All of it is in relationship to dealing with times of persecution and and tribulation. And to use other words that Paul used with the Thessalonians in, in 1 Thessalonians, All that he gives here is is, is when you're dealing with times of affliction. That's another word he uses. So suffering or tribulation or affliction or or persecution. That's what's before us. When Christians suffer. And we are so blessed to be in the United States of America. Um, If you believe that, say amen. So blessed because persecution in America is, is compared to other parts of the world very minimal in our young uh, country, 244, I think, years old. Uh, Very minimal, but we understand Christians are persecuted around the world, and there are different ways that Christians are persecuted, even uh, in the United States of America, and we'll deal with some of uh, the modern-day persecution. Uh, Understand, as Paul is trying to comfort these dear believers, they are dealing in their cultural context with life-threatening kind of persecution, like beheadings and Uh, being lit on fire to adorn Nero's garden party. Just because they believe Jesus of Nazareth uh, is is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. How many of you believe that? Would you say amen? amen? Yeah. And that belief is enough for them to have a heart full of anxiety and trepidation and, and, and fearfulness. Um, in relationship to whether or not they're going to get to continue to breathe in their uh, cultural context, their governmental situation. All right, so first of all, this morning, the reminder we see uh, in verse number five, we're dealing with persecution and tribulation, and, and Paul praises them for having an enduring patience. Verse number five, then, is a reminder. Verse number five is a reminder, and it's an, an amazingly like, well-written. Paul is known for his, his terrific writing. 
Um, and, and just stylistically, I think it's, it's beautiful to read, uh, poetic, really. Um, verse number five, he says that, that these persecutions and tribulations that they're enduring, that it is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Um, to, to put this idea of manifest token uh, in, in, a, in a more relatable 21st century way, the manifest token there is the idea of declaration. So your suffering, your persecution, is a, is a declaration. It is symbolic of the fact that you are a true child of God. That's what he's saying in verse number 5. So let that sink in for just a minute, that idea, and then we'll reread verse number 5, and I think you'll see that there in the text, that the manifest token is a, a declaration, or it is symbolic of the fact that you are a true child of God. Notice again the idea of tribulation and persecution that they're enduring. It is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. The, the phrase there, kingdom of God, has to do with their salvation. Um, for which ye also suffer. Now, I've called this a reminder because it was in 1 Thessalonians where he said something very similar, where he said, hey, saved people, how many of you know what it means to be saved? Would you say amen? You know what it means to be saved? He says, saved people, you're going to face persecution. You're going to face trying times just because you love Jesus. It's part of, it's, it's par for the course. For the Christian. And he said that, uh, if you would look back with me at, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse number, the end of verse number 2. The end of verse number 2, he says, concerning your faith. So we understand he's uh, talking to the church, those that have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light by faith, concerning their faith, because of their salvation, essentially. Um, he says in verse 3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions, this time of persecution, this time of trial in their lives. Don't be moved by it, for yourselves know that we are appointed there too. Again, it's par for the course that those people that love Jesus are going to face levels of, of persecution. And he uh, further elaborates in verse number 4, for verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. So when Paul was with them before, he told them. Then when he writes 1 Thessalonians, he tells them, hey, if you're going to be public with your love for Jesus, you're going to face some tribulation and some persecution. And then he tells them again in 2 Thessalonians, don't be alarmed, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're outspoken with your love for Jesus, church, that's what he's telling them, then you're going you're gonna to have to face uh, this type of trial and persecution. Now, if you hide the light of the gospel under a bushel, as the junior church song has so said, then you may face very little persecution. Um, but the more outspoken you are in any kind of um, worldly, carnal context, the more persecution comes your way. And persecution can be scary. The tribulation certainly is uncomfortable. And so here he is reminding them now three times at least that this is an element of the Christian faith. Doesn't this sound extremely contrary to what we know as the prosperity gospel? Right? A lot of the TV preachers tell you that, uh, you know, if you sow a seed by writing them a check, uh, sow a seed of faith of $1,000, your life's going to be peaches and cream, you know, cotton candy and Mountain Dew all day long, whatever, uh, you know, whatever works for you. It's going to be the my pillow guy all day, you know, the comforts of your comforter. It's just going to be roses. That's not what Paul tells a model church. No. Um, you speak out for Jesus, there's going to be adversity. Um, and, and one of the other ways he comforts them, uh, I believe really through verse number five, is that phrase, kingdom of God, you know, to be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Um, it's, I think it's an indirect reminder that this world is not our home, that we're just a passing through. Um, how many of you know that song? Would you raise your hand, this world is not my home? Yeah, uh, I've been singing it since I was a teenager at Calvary Baptist School there. You know that's based on the Bible. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse number 20. I love that verse where the Bible clearly says that, that this, uh, this, this, and I can't quote it exactly, the, the word in the King James is the idea of our conversation. It means our citizenship. 
uh, is not here, but it's up in heaven. We're merely pilgrims and strangers just traveling through this world because we have been adopted into the family of God. He is our Father. And so while we're here, yeah, Luke, Luke, Luke's writing tells us to occupy till he comes. Um, tells us to, to fulfill, Matthew's gospel tells us to fulfill the Great Commission. And, and uh, uh, Jesus uses the phrase as a 12-year-old boy to be about his father's business. I mean, we are to do the things with the stewardship uh, that we have on this earth of time uh, that God wants us to do. But, but remember, those of you that are facing persecution and tribulation, remember, it's a reminder this world is, is not your home for our conversation is in heaven from whence we look, listen to this, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that Jesus is coming again? I can't tell you the number of people that have talked to me about, you know, they watch the headlines and they see all the stuff happening around the, the, the country and even around the world and they say, Pastor, you think Jesus is coming soon? Oh, I absolutely do. You know, they'll ask about the eschatological implications of these riots and and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. I just, I just am listening for the trump of God to sound. You know, uh, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. Uh, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. It's a reminder that, that persecution, um, tribulations will come. I gave you a definition of tribulation last Sunday night as we dealt with, if you recall, um, the idea of being an overcomer from John 16, 33. I want to give you that same definition because here in the text is dealing with tribulation. Some of you say persecution, okay, I don't know how much that applies to me. Certainly it applies to the Thessalonian believers. But Pastor Johnson, uh, you know, the applications for me this morning might have to do more with tribulation because you might be facing some stuff. So what does the word tribulation mean? It's this idea. It is to feel broken or crushed by life's circumstances. It's uh, to feel pressed or squeezed by your situation or to be pressured or compressed where everything around you feels like it's pressing in upon you, like there is no escape. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I know I have. It's tribulation. He doesn't just address persecution, though the, the rest of the text primarily focuses on that, he also addresses tribulation because the result of tribulation is to have a heart full of anguish and feelings of trouble. And that's one reason why we are to be reminded that this world is not our home. We have a job here to do, yes, uh, but we so look forward uh, to the day where we're in his presence, uh, where we're in heaven for eternity. So the reminder is that suffering is, is par for the course. Not only that, secondly, this morning, the recompense is described in Scripture. The recompense. So, so what is, what, how should we deal with our persecutors um, or our tribulations? Is, are these things that we should uh, then take into our own hands? And to answer that question accurately, we would make a distinction between uh, persecutions and, and tribulations. To some extent, we do take into our own hands uh, solving our tribulations, to some extent. We should never, in our, our, our trying times, we should never worry about the aspects of it that we cannot control. So I don't know what your trying time is. I'm telling you, don't worry about the parts of it that you can't control, because that doesn't make any sense. But do you know what does make sense? To, to do everything you can do in relationship to the things that you can control. I know too many people that just say, oh, it's too much, I do feel pressed down, I do feel overwhelmed, and so I'm just going to give up. I'm just I'm going to let go and let God kind of a thing. And it sounds really spiritual, sounds you know, pious, sounds good. It's probably in a good Bible commentary somewhere, that little phrase. Uh, but I'm telling you, that God entrusts to each of us mental faculties and, and, and sometimes relational resources. And, and so often the answer to our trying time is for us to do our part, to pray like everything depends on God and to work like everything depends on us and making sure that we spend no time worrying about the aspects of it that we cannot control. So what does God do to the persecutors? Well, it speaks of recompense. It's the idea of paying them back. It's a financial term. We have people with financial experience uh, here in the house, and, um, and, and so maybe you relate to this uh, financial idea. 
righteousness. So seeing it as a righteous thing with God, verse number six, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So God's going to pay them back. So, so these Thessalonian believers who maybe were fearful in their cultural context because of persecution, Paul says, hey, be encouraged because God's going to get them. God's going to pay them back. God's going to address the situation. The all-knowing God knows exactly uh, the condition of your heart and the anxiety uh, that is there because of uh, your situation. So he encourages them with this idea that God's going to pay them back. God's going to get them. And we love, I think, if you're facing persecution, there is an element of comfort here, a, a, a thought of appreciation, that it's a righteous thing, a righteous thing, a good thing, a God-honoring thing for God to recompense tribulation to those that are persecuting you or troubling you. So if you're facing trouble, you're sure glad to hear, God's got this, God's going to deal with this. And it maybe brings to our mind the idea in Romans chapter 12, verse number 15, which is a quote from Deuteronomy 32, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He says, I will repay. So the text doesn't call us to avenge our situation, ourselves. Instead, it reminds us that it's a righteous thing that God's going God's to gonna get them. God's going to deal with them. Um, all right, so all that's true. Yeah, God's going to get them. But you know, sometimes people get, even Christian people, we get, uh, we get to rallying around this idea that God's going to get them in maybe an unbiblical or unhealthy way. You know, like, yeah! They did wrong to those Christian people, and those Christian people are good people. Now, God, your word says that you're going to get them. It's a righteous thing to you that you would uh, recompense tribulation on, on them that, that, trouble, that have been troubled. So, God, you get them. Yeah, hit them hard, God. Throw the book at them. You know, make them suffer. Make them endure. I just, I just want to point out that the person that's penning these words had been persecuted and was himself a persecutor. Like, don't forget what it says in Acts 7 and 8. Don't forget that Stephen died, stoned. And before uh, Paul's conversion, he was Saul, and Acts 8 tells us that he consented at the death of a deacon, the church of Jerusalem, a good man, Stephen, stoned. And then not only that, but don't forget Acts chapter 8, that that Paul was a man who made havoc of the church. And he went house to house creating havoc. And it says in Acts 8, I think verse number 3, that he hauled a bunch of Christian people off to prison. And not only that, not only did he consent at the death of Stephen, not only did he take Christian people from their homes uh, to prison, but he also himself murdered people who said, I believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah. I believe he's God. He murdered those people. And, and we know that, that, that there was blood on his hands because he admits it when he writes to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And don't forget, Paul says, I was before a blasphemer and, uh, do you know the next word? A persecutor. That's what we're dealing with here. He was a persecutor and the word is injurious. The idea of being a murderer. Oh, isn't it interesting that he's like saying, hey, to the, to the model church, yeah, you're facing some persecution, but, but God, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation on them. Paul says, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and I was injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. I'm trying to suggest to you that the, yeah, get them, God, is not Paul's spirit. Because I think really what Paul is trying to communicate here is that, that he, he really would like to see these persecutors obtain mercy. I mean, if you compare Scripture with Scripture to try to get some kind of gauge on Paul's attitude, I don't think he's gleeful at the wrath of God that is set against wicked sinners. No, I think he's compassionate and concerned because he used to be one of these guys. recompense. So yes, it's true to take comfort uh, in, in God dealing with our persecutors. And um, persecution uh, upon Christians, uh, it, it takes various forms, uh, various forms of oppression. 
and maybe that's something that on different levels Christians in America, 21st century America see, um, not only persecution in oppression, but also in execution. We've seen that in different parts of the world where Christians are executed because of their love for Christ. Um, but with a legislator here this morning, you know, sometimes persecution upon Christians shows itself in, in legislation. And he alluded to the uh, Stone versus Graham 1980 decision, you know, the extracting of the Ten Commandments from our public schools and the extraction of, of public prayer and um, the uh, 2015 uh, decision to make uh, same-sex marriage legal in all 50 states. And there's just all kinds of things that are just anti-God and anti-Christian. Um, and, and they show themselves in, in, in some level, anyways, of, of persecution against God, against God's people uh, through legislation. And yeah, Paul wants them to know God's going to address these things. And yet, I would suggest that Paul's not gleeful that people would face God's wrath. So there's a reminder, there's a recompense. Thirdly, there's a rest. There's a rest, and I go quickly. This word rest, I want you to see that there in verse number 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That little phrase, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, you might underline or circle that phrase, rest with us. Because after all this stuff about persecution and tribulation and suffering and affliction, it's like take a deep breath. That's what he's saying. The word rest, according to the Hebrew Greek study Bible that I have, is specifically the idea of relaxation. It's the idea of relief or to be at ease, to be at ease. So yeah, model church. Um, you've been through a lot. You're going through a lot. But rest with us. And this us is probably a reference to Paul, probably a reference to Silas and Timothy, uh, those men that are included in Acts 17 as uh, being a part of founding this church. Rest with us. It's not to say that Paul is so at ease because he's not going through any persecution. Because of course he is. Um, but there is an inner peace in their heart. Uh, remember what Paul said to the Corinthian believers where he gives that list of, of uh, in perils often and uh, just, just all the things that he's gone through. It's 1 Corinthians 16, I think. Um, uh, 40 stripes save one. I mean, he, Paul's been going through some persecution and yet he has rest in his heart. Um, and, and, and Silas and Timothy very likely do as well. It's, it's relax, it's take a deep breath, it's have relief, it's, it's be at ease, it speaks of this inner peace. And I give you uh, this definition for uh, what is happening, and it's the, a definition I gave you Sunday night as well uh, when we dealt with the idea of being an overcomer. But he's saying to them, he has a calmness of spirit in the face of mounting difficulties. That's what he means when he says rest with us. It doesn't mean that the problems aren't there. It means that, yes, there are problems, yet there's a calmness of spirit, there's a rest. Um, it is not the subtraction of the difficulties, but it is the addition of calmness in the midst of those difficulties. He is describing a tranquility of heart that only comes from Christ. So what are you dealing with? I would encourage you to pursue that peace that passeth all understanding that Philippians 4, 7 refers to. It passes all understanding because your problems are still there and yet God's people are encouraged to be calm, to take deep breaths, to, to relax, to take one day at a time in that situation. Um, there's, I said earlier, I say it again, there's no sense in worrying about what you cannot control, but there's lots of sense in doing everything you can to solve your own problems. So that's, that's the charge to rest. Fourthly and lastly, uh, this idea of revelation is given to us, revelation. And um, we see the word revealed in verse number seven, so we understand there is something to be revealed. Uh, this, this is the idea of revelation. So he says, to you that are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So how is this recompensing tribulation to them that trouble you actually going to shape up? Well, um, it shapes up in the idea of a, a re revelation where Jesus, listen to this, comes from heaven with his mighty angels. And if you uh, are interested in angelology, it's, it's very interesting to use the Strong's Concordance and look up, especially in Matthew's gospel, 
um, all the word angel that appears, and to find how many times angels are a part of uh, assisting Jesus in conquering uh, opposition to God. Uh, so, so, so this revelation shapes up in two ways. Uh, the, the first uh, end of verse 7, 8, and 9 give us the correction in the revelation where uh, those that stand against God are corrected. And then verse number 10, you see a coronation uh, in the revelation. All right, so correction and coronation. Notice that he's revealed from heaven. Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and this correction in flaming fire taking vengeance on two groups, them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And please understand what Romans 1 and 2 tell us. When people read that, oh, they don't know God, and it just seems, they, in a human 21st century mindset, it seems a little unjust that God would, in flaming fire, take vengeance on them that don't know him. But don't forget what Romans 1 and 2 tell us, that, that God has revealed himself through his creation, and God has also revealed himself in Romans 2 in our conscience in our conscience. And Romans 1 specifically uh, tells us, I think maybe verse 22, that they, they know God, but they deny uh, the power of God or the glory of God. And they, they, they choose, uh, and in Romans 1, they're turned over to the lusts of their own heart. They choose carnality and flesh, and they choose to turn their back on God. And then God eventually gives them over to the lust uh, of their own flesh. So, they may not have ever received a gospel tract. They may not have ever sat in an independent Baptist church uh, in the Bible Belt. But they've seen God's creation, and they have a, a, a conscience, and maybe over time that conscience is hardened to the things of God. But God wrote on their conscience just like he has any of ours. And so taking a vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh. And again, I don't think Paul's gleefully writing any of this. I think, I think Paul's also the guy who wrote that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I think there's great compassion in this, but there is also in this, there's also in this a revelation of the wrath of God. You ain't going to hear about the wrath of God in lots of churches. You're not. But you're going to hear it if you read your Bible and you listen to the Apostle Paul. I mean, if you know who Rob Bell is, he wrote the famous book, uh, Love Wins, a highly controversial book. And uh, Rob Bell basically uh, says that in the end, love wins, and everybody just goes to heaven, Universe, uh, universalist, you know. So, so it doesn't matter what religious road you're on. Rob Bell, who claims to be a Christian, uh, says everybody gets to go to heaven because in the end, love wins. Um, and when it comes to the wrath of God, what does Rob Bell say? Well, Rob Bell basically equates the wrath of God um, with your parents being disappointed in you. And, um, and so for now, um, you know, little Johnny, you need to go stand in the corner because you talk back to your mother and that's unacceptable. So uh, no bubble gum for you today. You got 10 minutes in the corner, you know. And, and so he totally minimizes the wrath of God. Did you hear the words in the text? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Listen, what you should see here is, what you should see here is how heinous our sin, sin is to God. How, yes, he's loving, and we appreciate certainly uh, the love of God and that attribute of God's love, but while he is, also, he is loving, he is also holy, and his wrath is set against sinners, and the wages of sin is death speaks of separation from God for all of eternity. And so this first aspect of Revelation is correction. And, and, and remember Paul said, I, I read you that verse, I quoted that verse in um, 1 Timothy 1, 13, that he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and he was injurious, but he did it ignorantly and in unbelief. He didn't believe at that time. And yet he says, I obtained mercy. I think the spirit of Paul is that that these that don't know God and that are not obeying the gospel, I think he wants them to obey the gospel. I think he wants them to obtain God's mercy uh, and understand that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
uh, the correction continues in verse number 9, who shall be punished uh, with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. These phrases are all very important. Our time is almost gone. I, I, I would love to unpack these phrases. I hope you'll study them more uh, uh, in the future. But, but from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, this idea of everlasting destruction, extremely important. You know, some people believe in annihilationism, and they get that from the word destruction, so that when uh, sinners who know not Jesus die, uh, they go to hell, yes, because Jesus taught about hell, and the annihilationist has to acknowledge that, um, but that they, that they are destroyed. Uh, and, and the problem with annihilationism is the word right before the word destruction, and that is everlasting. Uh, what are the worst torments of hell? Well, I conclude that the worst agony of hell, among many agonies, is that, it's, is that of its eternality. It's forever um, in, in flaming fire, forever where the worm dieth not, forever uh, where the fire is not quenched, forever in eternal, eternal darkness. It's, it's everlasting destruction. Souls are not annihilated. And, and another startling aspect of, of hell is that they are taken from the presence of the Lord. What's the most beautiful thing about heaven? Well, here it is, that Jesus is there. And, and one of the most startling things about hell is that they are removed from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. We don't want to see anybody go to hell. If you're here under the sound of my voice, you say, I don't have a personal relationship with God. You might be religious, but listen, I don't want to see you die and go to a devil's hell. I want you to trust Jesus today. And I'm not asking you to be a Baptist or join our church. I'm asking you to just trust Jesus so that you don't die in your own sin and face God's wrath for your sin. So the revelation is correction, but it's also coronation. Verse number 10 gives us that. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. So, so remember verse number 7, uh, that from heaven Jesus will come with his mighty angels. Verse number 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. And so, so the word glorified and then and to be admired, these all speak of a, of a coronation or of an adoration. Admired and glorified, notice this, in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So, so Paul is saying to this dear church that he loves very much. He's saying, you guys are one day going to glorify. You're the saints. You're going to glorify Jesus, the one who is coming with his angels. And you're going to admire him. And you're not going to face God's wrath and be separated from the presence of God in hell for all of eternity. No, you are going to have an opportunity to be in his presence and to adore him. And, um, and, he, and he points out at the end there that it's because of your belief. It's because of your belief. And they believed in part because of, because of Paul's belief, uh, because of Silas's belief, because of Timothy's belief. So the Christian gospel boils down to that idea, uh, the word belief. You know, it's, it's 21 chapters John's gospel is, but some 85 times, the non-synoptic John's gospel, 85 or so times, uses the word belief. I know we live in a pluralistic society, but in spite of pluralism, it still matters what you believe. So, do you believe that you're a sinner? Do you believe that you need a Savior? Do you believe that Jesus is the exclusive way to the Father? Because today is the day of salvation before it's eternally too late. Would you bow with me, please, for prayer?